Um, okay, so today we have Kelly Pollard talking to us about the ROC3 graded free down cohomology and C3 surfaces. Take it away, Kelly. All right, thank you. Um, so thanks everyone for coming and thank you to Sarah for organizing. So uh, I guess I'll say broadly speaking, I am working in this field of equivariant homotopy theory, but more specifically, I've been studying this cohomology theory, ROG graded Braidon cohomology for spaces with an action of a finite group G. Um, and I guess I'll say in particular, I've been focusing on the case when the group is the cyclic group of order three. So, uh, you know, I'm a bit fortunate to piggyback off of a few of the things Sarah said on Monday since she just presented a couple of days ago. Uh, but, you know, as Sarah mentioned, there is a decent amount of interest in studying this ROG graded world. Um, and there aren't a ton of explicit computations which have been done in this cohomology theory just because there's a lot of structure and there's a lot of stuff going on uh, that makes these computations a bit more difficult. So, and, and what does exist in terms of computations is mostly concentrated in the case where the group is the cyclic group of order two. And so this project, uh, the goal is to compute the cohomology of surfaces with an action of the cyclic group of order three in this ROC three graded theory um, and attempt to expand on the list of computations which have been done uh, and also break a little bit into um, uh, cyclic groups of prime order, odd prime order. So I guess I'll start with a bit of an outline and some general plan here. Uh, so like I said, the main goal here is to talk about the cohomology of these C3 surfaces. And whenever I was going through this project, um, in order to compute the cohomology of the surfaces, I needed to understand what all of these surfaces actually looked like. And so, you know, I needed some classification and you would expect a classification of these, you know, C3 surfaces to be a classical problem. And it is, uh, at least in the orientable case, but the problem is that the classifications that are out there are not particularly accessible and they're not very geometric. So they don't lend themselves super well to these cohomology computations. Um, and uh, Dan Duggar in 2019 kind of saw this issue and, Rederived a classification of surfaces with an involution um, using this method called equivariant surgery, which basically says, okay, let's take some, you know, examples, some pool of surfaces that are kind of basic that I understand super well, and I'll kind of build more complicated, more interesting surfaces out of them by doing some gluing operation and, and gluing on some additional pieces. And then I showed that you can obtain all the surfaces in this way. And so I set out to um, adapted that result in the case of uh, surfaces with an action of C3. And you know, going back to the C2 case, after Dan Duggar presented this classification, uh, one of his students, Christy Hazel, did compute the cohomology of those surfaces in this ROC2 graded theory. And so then I also wanted to adapt that for um, the prime three as well. So I want to, in this talk, talk about both of those aspects of this project. I want to talk about the surfaces classification a little bit. Just It's mostly just going to be some pictures. Um, I'll kind of show you what these basic building blocks look like and what the surgery operations look like, and then just kind of state for you what the classification says. Um, and then I want to move on to the cohomology side of things. I'm not really going to get into too much about you know what this theory, or I should say like how we define this theory or whatever. I'm just going to kind of hopefully motivate this, you know, why we would care about a theory graded in this way and give you some basic properties of it. And then the meat, what I really wanna to get to is um, just going through a few different examples, uh, just some small computations, which not only will hopefully give you a flavor of the computations and the types of things I was thinking about when going through this project, but then also, um, I want to hopefully highlight the connection between, you know, what's going on in the surface classification and how that translates to the cohomology. So I'll just jump right into it with a bunch of examples of surfaces. <laughs> um, so the just going to be a lot of pictures and a lot of pointing. And like I said before, my laser pointer is a bit laggy, so um, I'll try my best to sync that up a little bit. So um, I just wanna start by kind of throwing out there some examples of surfaces that aren't too difficult to define. 
Um, so for example, you know, we might be familiar with this rotating torus, it rotates 120 degrees about that axis going through the center of its uh, donut hole. Um, I also have this sphere rotating 120 degrees, those are kind of uh, maybe the first examples you think of. There is, uh, over here I have this free action on the Klein bottle, so if I take the Klein bottle and I Kind of think of it as the standard unit square with the identifications of the edges made in a specific way. Uh, the way I like to think about this action, uh, roughly speaking, is you kind of take some point, you sort of shift over by a third and then flip over this, um, you know, y equals one half line. And if I start here and I do that three times, I get down here and that's identified with the point that I started with. So this is an order three action. Um, and and then I have these guys down here in the bottom left and the bottom right. So I can start with a hexagon that's got some obvious order three symmetry. I rotate 120 degrees. Um, and then there are some identifications of the edges that I can make, uh, which then give me some uh, closed surface and induces a C3 action on that surface. So down here in the bottom right, what I end up getting, um, if I identify the edges in the way shown, I get RP2. And this is um, action on RP2 with a single fixed point. And then down here on the left, this guy is actually just the uh, single hold torus. So I get an action on that with three fixed points. So um, before I kind of move on to the, the surgery, which tells me, okay, now how can I build more interesting surfaces out of these? I just want to take a second and mention some notation and conventions that I'm going to use for the rest of the talk. Um, first of all, anytime you see a point in blue like these guys, those are just going to be denoting fixed points. So that's just going to be a shortcut for me. Um, in general, I'll use MG to denote the G-hold torus and NR, the genus R non-orientable surface. Um, Brackets and any number you see in brackets will usually denote the number of fixed points of my action. Um, and then these guys down here, the hex one and the S21, those are slight outliers in my um, notation and I'll kind of explain those in a bit when I get there. Okay, so we have some C3 surfaces that we know and understand. And you know the question is, okay, how can we just use these to create a whole bunch of other surfaces? So there's two surgery operations that I wanna define. And I guess I have some words at the bottom, but really you can just kind of focus on the picture. An example I think highlights what's going on fairly clearly. Um, so what, what is this equivariant connect sum? So I can define an equivariant connect sum by starting with some C3 surface X, specifically a non-trivial one. Um, and some non-equivariant surface Y. So in this case, I'm starting with this sphere S21 and the non-equivariant surface is this um, torus. And how do I describe this operation? Well, I'll take my equivariant surface and I'll remove three conjugate disks from it. And then I'll take my torus, I'll remove a disk, and then I'll take three copies of it, uh, you know, take that time C3. So I've got three copies of the torus minus a disk, and then I have this action which kind of rotates them. Um, so now I can identify the boundary of these two objects using some equivariant map. And what I end up with is this space over here on the right, which in general I'll call X connect sum Y. Uh, in this case, this is S21 connect sum torus. Uh, and so what, what do we actually have in practice? This is a three hold torus. This is a rotation action with two fixed points. Um, and in general, this equivariant connect sum surgery is going to take some non-trivial surface. It's gonna give you one with a higher genus, you know, assuming you're connect something more, something more interesting than a sphere. Uh, and then it's not going to change the number of fixed points you have at all. So that's one of our operations. Um, I have a second one called uh, equivariant ribbon surgery. Similar idea, so I'm gonna start with some non-trivial C3 surface. Again, I'll call it X, but in this example, I'm just using the sphere. Um, and then I've got this, this surface here called, I'll just call it R3, um, it's really the same thing as, it's just homeomorphic to the sphere minus three disks, but um, I kind of like to draw it in this different way just because that's the way I like to think about it. Um, it is this surface with three boundary components. It rotates 120 degrees, two fixed points. Um, so the, the procedure here is I start with my equivariant surface, I remove three disks from it, and then I identify the boundary of these two objects using some equivariant map, and, and I get something that looks like what I have on the right here. Um, I'll denote this x plus bracket r3, um, and then in this case, this is the sphere 
plus R3. So performing this operation gives me some surface with a higher genus and more fixed points. Uh, in this case, this is an action on the two-hole torus with four fixed points. Okay, so um, these are all the surgery operations I'm going to define for this talk because it turns out it's kind of all I need in order to state the classification result. And I really wish I could say that this was enough to state the result, but unfortunately, we're not done. I still need, uh, I actually need another family of surfaces um, before I can state the final result. And the surfaces are a bit weird to define, so I'll just kind of describe them roughly. Um, so, you know, I mentioned this torus on the first page with three fixed points. I start with a hexagon and I make identifications in some way. I called it hex one. Um, so if I start with one of those and then I take another copy of it and I kind of attach them in this specific way, you can see uh, in the picture. Um, and maybe I can tack on more and more and more. I just keep adding on these hexagons. In general, if I have a tower of N of these guys kind of glued together in a specific way, uh, this I'll call hex N. This describes the C3 action on the 3N minus two hold torus. Um, this action has three N fixed points, kind of three coming from each of the, the hexagons in my tower. So, um, a couple of things. So first of all, I didn't define for you all of the surgery operations that were needed in the project and needed to prove the classification. Um, and you can actually define these spaces using surgery operations, using some of the ones that I haven't defined. But it turns out to be kind of messy. And I didn't really want to present it this way for the talk, just because there's a lot of well-definedness issues going on. Um, you know, with the ribbon surgery and the connect sum surgery, I was a little bit loose with it because it didn't really matter which discs you remove from the surface when you perform the surgery. But there are other surgeries which kind of do depend on some choices. And so um, we'll just say we have these other surfaces, these hexagon towers, and um, you can perform your ribbon surgery and your connect sum on these surfaces as well. So the, the main result basically says that I can achieve any surface I want or any non-trivial C3 surface, or I should say closed connected C3 surface is isomorphic to some surface obtained by, you know, starting with one of these guys I showed before, either something from that original first page uh, or one of these hexagon towers. I perform some number of ribbon surgeries on it and I perform some equivariant connect some. And it turns out I can get every C3 surface this way. Um, and I have kind of six classes or six families of these guys, uh, and it turns out these are all distinct isomorphism classes. So anything I get by starting with a sphere is going to be different than something I get by starting with a hexagon tower, for example. So um, there is a result, I do have a result for odd primes in general along the same vein. It's kind of similar. You can define these same surgery operations in an analogous way. You have sort of similar building block surfaces. It just in general is a little bit less clean um, with uh, you know higher P just because for example, you don't have one isomorphism class of you know rotating sphere. You have two now in the P plus five case, for example. And so um, it just gets more complicated very quickly, but at its core, it kind of looks the same. You're starting with some of these basic surfaces and you're building more complicated ones using specifically like the ribbon surgery and the connect sum, et cetera. Um, I guess this is a good place to pause and ask for questions just about this like surface stuff before I start talking about cohomology. Okay, great. Okay, so, um, yeah, the, the goal here was to take this surface or all these surfaces now and compute their cohomology in this in this ROC3 graded Braidon theory. So uh, just to clarify, it's graded on the growth and group of real finite dimensional orthogonal C3 representations. So let's kind of start and think about, remind ourselves about C3 representations. So if I have some C3 representation V, um, it's, some num it's some sum of its irreducibles. So what are the irreducibles here? Well, we've got the one dimensional trivial representation so it's just my line, my real line with the trivial action. I've got my two-dimensional rotating guy. So I've got the plane rotating 120 degrees about the origin. 
And uh, I can, you know, think of this as we've got, let's say, Q copies of this two-dimensional irreducible. And let's say that the total dimension of my representation is P, which means that I've got P minus two Q copies of the trivial representation. Um, and so then when I define this in this way, V, my representation is actually just dependent on P and Q. And so I'll just kind of write R, P, Q, and, and think of this as dependent on those values. So I, okay, I've got some representation. Um, and from a representation, I can construct a special type of sphere called a representation sphere. Uh, so I can, you know, take my representation, I can add a fixed point at infinity. And, you know, when I one point compactify real space, I get a sphere. And in this case, now the sphere inherits a C3 action. So for example, I'll say, you know, if I look here, if I started with a trivial two-dimensional representation, so the plane with a fixed action, if I add a fixed point at infinity, now I have a two sphere and that has a trivial action. On the other hand, if I started with the rotating, two-dimensional rotating irreducible representation and added a fixed point, then I um, one point factify I get a two sphere and now this rotates. So with this special type of sphere, which by the way, you know, in general you denote it SV, but since V just depends on P and Q, I'll, I'll call that SPQ. Um, so you know, if I have a special type of sphere, I can take a C3 surface and I can take the smash product with that sphere. So for example, um, if alpha sum representation, I can take S alpha smash X. And this gives me some notion of suspension for which it'd be nice to have a suspension isomorphism. I mean, this is where my you know, desire for this ROSD3 grading comes into play because, uh, you know, in order to make sense of the suspension isomorphism, we need to be able to add representations here. So um, this, Isomorphism says that the reduced V cohomology of X is the same as the reduced V plus alpha cohomology of the alpha suspension of X. Okay, so again, I'm just kind of telling you, taking for granted, we have this theory, it has this suspension isomorphism. Um, this theory takes coefficients in a Mackie functor, and I'm also going to not talk about that too much. Uh, I We'll say that in this talk, I'll just be using the constant Z3 Mackie functor for my coefficients the whole time. And we can think of that as analogous in some sense to uh, Z3 coefficients in singular cohomology. So we'll just kind of keep that in the back of our heads instead of uh, you know, emphasizing this uh, Mackie functor. And because I'm always going to be working in the same Mackie functor, I'm just going to suppress the notation a little bit. So I'll say specifically in general, you know, when I want to denote the V cohomology of my space X in this Mackie functor uh, coefficients, then I'll just say it's the PQ cohomology of X and not include the coefficient. So since my um, representation V just depends on P and Q, I can really think of this as a bigraded theory. So I want to compute the cohomology of these surfaces, but specifically as modules over the cohomology of a point. So that's kind of where I want to go next. Um, the cohomology of the point is this ring I'm calling M3. And I will depict this and in general, the cohomology of all spaces on this PQ grid since we're bigraded. So let's see how this works. So every dot you see here is a copy of Z mod three. And my convention in these pictures is that the uh, PQ's cohomology of my space is above and to the right of the PQ spot on my grid. So like this guy right here, it's above and to the right of the origin. And so it represents the zero zeroth cohomology of a point. So uh, the zero zeroth cohomology is Z3, but you know, the minus one zero cohomology is zero, for example. So what's going on in this picture? Well, I have generators uh, in degree zero one called X, degree one one, which I'll call Y, degree two one, which I'll call Z. Um, and the top cone looks like polynomials in X, Y, and Z, uh, where Y squared is zero. So what's going on here is that, you know, vertical lines in this picture represent multiplication by X. Uh, lines of slope one represent multiplication by y, and lines of slope one half, which these are probably not beautiful drawings here, represent multiplication by z. So, um, you know, for example, you know, this guy here, well, that's y times z, or the generator in that degree would look like y times z. Uh, 
So the, the top cone looks like these polynomials and these generators. What does the bottom cone look like? Well, um, I've got this guy w in degree 0 minus 1. It's infinitely divisible by x and z, and it's divisible by y. You can kind of see the ring structure down here. And in general, I'll kind of denote elements in this bottom cone in some specific way, like this guy, for example, in degree minus 1 minus 3. I would call w over xy, because this is the guy when I multiply by x and I multiply by y, I get back to w. So I'll kind of denote all the elements in the bottom cone by this way. Yeah, is there a question? Yeah, uh, can you turn back to the last page just for a second? Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, yeah, so, you know, this is generally what this guy looks like, and this extends infinitely. So, this is a um, very messy ring, non-Noetherian, and, and there's a lot going on. So whenever I depict this, like I said before, in general, I'll always kind of depict these cohomologies in this grid. So just to keep the pictures cleaner, I'll just include kind of an outline of this cone. Um, and we'll have to remember all of the structures sitting in there. Okay, so that is uh, M3. And I want to talk about some other M3 modules which show up a lot in the computations. But before I do that, I'm going to actually uh, mention a couple of important properties that my cohomology theory has. So first of all, there is the quotient lemma, which uh, is a really nice way to relate our cohomology theory to singular cohomologies. So it says that if I have some nice um, C3 space, then if I look at the P0 cohomology, so this would be the cohomology right along that row sitting above the horizontal axis. Um, if I kind of read across that row, what I should end up seeing is just the singular cohomology of what I get when I quotient by the action. So I can always kind of start looking in that row and I should uh, be able to figure out what we get there. And then the second, uh, the second lemma here tells me how to take the cohomology of spaces, which look like, you know, if I start with some non-equivariant space y, I can take a C3 times y, so that's just y with these three rotating copies, and it tells me how to take the cohomology of spaces like this. So maybe to understand what this result is saying a little bit, I can say, okay, well, let's just kind of refer to the quotient lemma for a second. Uh, the quotient lemma tells me that um, the cohomology, at least along that q equals zero row, should be just the same as the singular cohomology of y, what I get when I push it by the action. Um, and so that's what this says. We see the singular cohomology of y showing up. And then this part's just telling me we also have this invertible, uh, x is invertible, so we can have this multiplication by x here. Uh, I guess pictorially, I can show you what that looks like. So for example, you know, C3, if I want to know the cohomology of that, that's C3 times a point. So I've got three rotating points here. Um, if I look along this Q equals zero row, I should see the singular cohomology of a point that's concentrated in degree zero. And then we've just got this invertible multiplication by X here. So we've got all these powers of X and then you know X to minus one, X to minus two, et cetera. So we'll see these kind of towers showing up. So this, com or this module actually shows up a lot in our computations. Um, at least often it shows up shifted. And um, we also see the cohomology of the freely rotating circle show up quite a lot. This is just what it looks like. I'm not really gonna talk about um, where it comes from, but you can kind of compute this as well. Uh, and then one last module I'm gonna mention, and then we'll actually start doing some computations, uh, is the cohomology of this space, which I'm denoting EB and just calling the egg beater. Uh, so I can think of it as the cofiber of this map, which takes three points C3 and crushes it to a fixed point. Um, it looks like this here, and its cohomology is depicted on the right. So as an M3 module, it's generated by these guys alpha and beta here. And um, we have the property, you know, y alpha is zero, uh, w over x to the i beta is zero, and then z alpha is y beta. So if I take alpha and multiply it by z, it's the same as taking beta and multiplying by y. <clears throat> so you can kind of see the, the module structure here in the picture. 
Uh, and again, I'll have an abbreviated version of this. I will include in my computations just an outline of this shape, which looks like two truncated cones here. And we'll just kind of have to remember the structure that's going on. OK, we've got all of our M3 modules. I, I Now I'm ready to actually go through a couple of computations. So first of all, I just want to start and try to compute the cohomology of one of these kind of more basic surfaces that I, I presented right at the beginning. So the one I'm choosing to go through is, you know, we've got this action on RP2, which just looks like rotation um, by 120 degrees. So the main trick that I'm going to use in every single one of these computations is let's construct a cofiber sequence and look at the long exact sequence on cohomology. Um, hopefully being able to, um, you know, use spaces whose cohomology we already understand. So for example, I can take this freely rotating circle um, and with a disjoint base point, I can include it into my space. Uh, and then whenever I take the cofiber, uh, I end up with the, um, the rotating sphere that we've seen before. So I know the cohomology of this space, I know the cohomology of this space. So if I look at the long exact sequence on cohomology, then you know, maybe I have a chance of understanding this connecting homomorphism and you know, its kernel and its co-kernel will come together to make up the cohomology of uh, N11. And I, I'm slightly lying here. We don't just get one long exact sequence on cohomology. You actually get one for each Q. So um, we get a bunch of these guys. And if I kind of look at the total differential, then that is going to be a, an M3 module map. So the differential kind of with all of these different long exact sequences, I get an M3 module map. So that's going to be our goal. We try to figure out what this differential map looks like. So I'll kind of restate this on a new page. Um, my differential goes from the stuff in red, the rotating sphere cohomology or rotating circle cohomology, to the stuff in blue shifted up one in the p degree. So, um, you know, where could we possibly have a differential? So, for example, there's this copy of Z3 here, there's a copy of Z3 here. So, we could have this differential map. Ooh, my pen is being a little spazzy. We could have this differential map right there, for example. Or, you know, maybe we have them up here, or maybe we have some down here. And then also, again, we have to be careful because there's all these copies of Z3 sitting in here inside the cone. So we could also have some maps, you know, going over here and down this way. So we have to compute all these maps. Um, so where to start? Well, let me clean this up a little bit. I think the best place to start is with the quotient lemma and isolating this row here. So let's start by thinking about what the quotient limit tells us. So the quotient limit tells us that the cohomology of my space is the same as the singular cohomology of what I get when I quotient by the action. So what do I get in this case? Well, you know, maybe you might need to convince yourself of it for a second, but if I start with this rotating um, RP2 and I quotient by the action, I actually just get a copy of RP2. And really, I, I'm going to emphasize this. This is in Z3 coefficients in singular cohomology. So what does the singular cohomology of RP2 look like in Z3 coefficients? Well, that's just the same as the cohomology of a point. It's concentrated in a degree zero. So what does that tell us? Well, OK, we see something here in degree 0. And that's going to have to be in the kernel of my differential, because there's nothing for it to hit. There's nothing in blue for it to hit. But you know, what does this tell us about this map? Well, um, I know that you know, I don't want, sorry. I don't want this guy here in red to end up being in the kernel of my map, uh, because you know, I know there shouldn't be anything there in the cohomology of N11. So this map here, D10, has to be an isomorphism. Otherwise, that guy would be in our kernel, and, and we can't have that. That would contradict the quotient lemma. So this map that I have highlighted here must be an isomorphism. OK, so how does that actually help us determine what the rest of the maps have to look like? Well, now we can just kind of use the fact that the differential is an M3 module map and linearity, and that just gets us pretty much everything else. So like, for example, if I wanted to ask, OK, well, is there a map between these two copies of Z3 down here? 
Um, and the answer is yes, there is an isomorphism there because you know if I multiply by x and map over, I get something non-zero. So if I map over and multiply by x, I should also get something non-zero. So you know everything down here. So these d1 q's where q is less than zero is also an isomorphism. So all of these guys for the same reasoning has to be an isomorphism. I can play a similar game down here. Uh, you know, I've got a map coming from this guy in degree zero, potentially to this guy in degree one. Sorry, the picture is getting a little crowded, but maybe I have a map going there and we can use the same linearity game to determine that actually that has to be an isomorphism as well. So all of these maps in the fourth quadrant are isomorphisms. And then again, similar linearity reasons tell us uh, we can use some argument to tell us that all these maps in the first quadrant have to be zero. So we can determine individually every differential map and additively say, okay, the um, cohomology of N11 looks like what I have on the left here. Everything in red was in the kernel, everything in blue was in the co-kernel. So together they make up the cohomology of N11. And then we ask, okay, what's the module structure here? So, you know, how do we solve this extension problem? Uh, and there are, you know, a couple ways to think about it, but the easiest one is just that we should see a copy of M3 showing up in our answer because we have a fixed point in our space. And so, you know, we actually are going to end up having to have some extensions here. Uh, in order to make a copy of M3 show up. So the answer in this case, we, we see the cohomology of my RP2 with the rotation is just the same as the cohomology of a point, it's just M3. Okay. Um, now I want to kind of bring it up a notch and think about an example now where I've uh, performed some surgery operation. So, the example that I had before was, you know, I started with a sphere and maybe I did this echovariant connect sum surgery with the torus. So I've got three of these tori hanging on and I cleaned the picture up a little bit. And this guy on the right, it just looks like a fidget spinner. So that's what I'm going to call it. Um, so now I want to compute the cohomology of this fidget spinner object. Um, so what's the idea? Well, it's the exact same idea that we had before, uh, same procedure. So I want to construct a cofiber sequence using spaces that I'm familiar with and look at the long exact sequence on cohomology. Well, this time I can, you know, think back to how this was constructed and that usually is going to give me a good indication of uh, how we want to construct the cofiber sequence. So in this case, I'm going to take these three, you know, C3 times the torus minus the disc, I'm going to include it into my space. And then when I take the cofiber, what I get, it's not quite a two sphere, but it's a sphere with these three points identified to a fixed point. Um, and up to homotopy, that's a sphere wedge and egg beater. So, okay, I can look at the long and stack sequence on cohomology. And my job, once again, is going to be to compute this total differential, which goes from the cohomology of my three tori to the cohomology of a sphere wedge and egg beater. So kind of refer to this similar picture again. Um, and now it's a little bit busier, but we still kind of still have the same job. We need to compute the differential map in all of these degrees. So uh, one thing I'll kind of point out before I get started, just to keep the picture from being too busy, I just labeled a two here because we've got two, we've actually got two towers in degree one. Um, the singular cohomology of a torus minus a disc has rank two in degree one. So we got two copies sitting there. So let's do the same thing we did last time. And let's just start by isolating this Q equals zero row here and trying to compute the cohomology there. And again, there's only kind of one possible location where we have a non-zero differential because uh, there just isn't anything, any other um, Anything else coming from the co or coming from the cohomology of the sphere wedge, the egg beater. So um, we'll start with the quotient lemma again. So what is this telling us? This says that the p zero cohomology of this space, this uh, fidget spinner, is the same as the singular cohomology, 
of what I get when I quotient by the action. So what do I get in this case? Well, you can maybe visualize it. If I quotient by the action, I just get a single torus. <clears throat> and this is in Z3 coefficients. So what does that look like? Well, that Z3 in degree zero and two, and that Z3 plus Z3 in degree one, zero everywhere else. So that's actually what I see right now, right? I've got this guy here in degree zero, I've got two guys in degree one, and then I've got this guy in degree two. So what does that mean for this map that I'm considering? Well, I actually want both of those copies of Z3 I see in red to be in the kernel. So this map has to be zero. This is a zero map. Uh, I play the same exact game as I did last time with linearity. I can determine that all of the maps sitting up here in the first quadrant coming from these rightmost towers uh, have to be zero. I see that all these maps in the fourth quadrant coming from these rightmost towers have to be zero. Um, and it turns out that the only place where we potentially have something non-zero uh, is down here in the fourth quadrant. Maybe we have some non-zero maps right there. So that, that's actually the, the thing that we have to determine. So um, the question to answer at this point, you know, is um, D0 minus one, the zero map. And if we can determine that one, then we can determine all of them. <clears throat> so this is a bit of a stumbling point because, you know, at least given everything I've kind of presented so far, we don't really have a lot else to work with to determine what this map has to be. So at this point, I'm going to kind of turn to two observations, which will help us determine what's going on with this map. So write those down here. So first of all, my fidget spinner has a fixed point in it. Um, and so we should see the cohomology of a point showing up in my answer. So we should have a copy of M3 inside the cohomology of the fidget spinner. That's the first observation I want to make. The second observation I want to make is that, OK, you know, we haven't computed the co-kernel yet. But whatever that co-kernel is, I know from my long exact sequence, it's going to include as a submodule of the cohomology of my fidget spinner. So we also know that the co-kernel of the differential is including as a submodule of this. Do. Okay. Um, and you know what does that tell us? Well, that means specifically that the module structure in the co-kernel is preserved inside the uh, cohomology of the fidget spinner. So how can we use this to, to help us determine what's going on? Well, let's just start by making an assumption here. Um, and let's just assume that this map down here is actually zero. So in fact, if that map zero, all of these differential maps are zero. Every single potential differential map is actually just zero. And everything you currently see on the screen in red is in the kernel. Everything you currently see in blue on the screen is in the co-kernel of my map. <clears throat> okay. So, you know, what can we say in this case? Well, I should see a copy of M3 showing up. Like this, what you see on the screen, everything is in the kernel and the co-kernel. So this is just additively the cohomology of the fidget spinner. And we should see some copy of M3 show. Up. Maybe there's some weird extension thing happening, but I don't really see that. So, okay, that's a little bit worrisome. And, you know, how can we really determine that there's a problem? Well, first of all, if you kind of think back to what M3 looks like, um, as an example, I'll say we, we should have this element down here, which I highlighted several slides ago, that looks like W over X Y uh, in, in this degree minus one minus three. We should have, if we have some copy of M3 in my answer, I should have something that looks like this element. Uh, and you know what did we say about this element? Well, when I multiply by X and multiply by Y, I get back to W. And also if I take this guy and I multiply by Z, I should get zero. Um, but anything that's sitting in this by degree right now is actually coming from the co-kernel. It's coming from something in blue. And so its module structure is preserved. But everything sitting there, actually, when I multiply by z, I get something non-zero. So we don't have anything sitting in that by degree that behaves like this element w over x, y. This is a problem because we should have m3 showing up. Uh, so this is a contradiction. And in fact, it actually means that this map 
that we, this D zero minus one that we kind of assumed was zero before can't be zero. Uh, and so we get a map here and we get a bunch of non-zero differentials down here in the fourth quadrant. Okay, so that actually tells us what all the rest of these differentials look like. And so I can, again, collect what I know to be in the kernel, what I know to be in the co-kernel and um, uh, try to ask myself, okay, well, how do these guys come together? What's this extension problem look like? Um, well, we again expect maybe this to be a non-trivial extension just because we know M3 should be showing up. And it turns out that is what's going on. So I can say on the right here, this is what we get for our final answer. We get copy of M3, we've got a shifted copy of M3, and then we see these two towers showing up. So what I want to do here is I want to kind of ask the question, you know, how does this cohomology here differ from that of the sphere, which is, you know, what we built this space out of. Um, the cohomology of the sphere we know from the suspension isomorphism, well, that should just look like the cohomology of a point, and then also a shifted cohomology of a point. So actually the cohomology of the sphere is just these two copies of M3. And the additional information that's showing up in this case are these two towers. And this turns out to be just like a greater pattern that ends up happening. Um, anytime I take some surface and I uh, take a connect sum, I end up seeing just some number of copies of these cohomology, the shifted comb. Uh, shifted copies of the cohomology of C3 showing up and some number corresponding to the genus of um, whatever I summed onto it. So that's, you know, one of my surgery operations. Um, and then uh, the other one is ribbon surgery. And now I kind of want to do another example where I highlight what's going on in that uh, for this type of surgery. So this is a cleaned up version of the example that I gave earlier in the talk. Uh, we have, we started, maybe I'll write this down. So we started with a rotating sphere and we added on this ribbon guy. Drawing on the fly does not work quite so well for me. And maybe now you see why I wanted to do this as slides. Um, and so, okay, when I uh, take the sphere and I remove three disks from it and I identify the boundary of the sphere with the boundary of this object R3, uh, kind of smoothing out the picture a little bit, what I get is it looks something like this. It's a two-hole torus, it's a rotating action, it's got four fixed points. So I want to compute the cohomology of this space. Um, I didn't say this on the last slide because I just kept calling it the fidget spinner, but to kind of reiterate my notation here, I'm calling this guy sphere 2-4 just because it was constructed using a sphere. It's um, a two-hole torus and it's got four fixed points. Okay, so let's do our usual strategy of constructing a cofiber sequence. Um, so this time I'm going to include this guy highlighted in red, which I'm just calling Y generically, uh, into my space. Uh, up to homotopy, that's actually just uh, a wedge of two egg beaters. If you kind of retract this a little bit. Uh, and then whenever I take the cofiber of this, I end up getting just a rotating sphere. So I know what the cohomology of the egg beaters look like. I know what the cohomology of the sphere is. So we're in good shape and we can think about this long exact sequence on cohomology. And again, you know, focus on computing this differential. So, okay, let's do that. Um, again, the differential is going from the stuff in red to the stuff in blue uh, and it's shifting up one and the p degree. So it's an M3 module map. Um, and so I can very easily, I don't even have to use the quotient lemma here. I can tell you that, you know, there's nothing in blue for this guy to hit. So the generator of this copy of M3 down here in degree zero, zero, it maps to zero. So everything coming from that uh, maps to zero. So that's fine. And the only thing we really need to worry about are these egg beaters here. The question is, you know, are there any differential maps coming from these guys? And as an M3 module, those two are generated by, remember these elements I called alpha and beta. And so I just need to analyze the differential in those spots. And then it tells me what's going on everywhere else. Okay, well, beta is easy because 
again, there's nothing for it to hit. There, there is nothing in blue here in degree uh, three one for this guy beta to hit. So the differential on beta is zero. I'm being a little bit sloppy because there's actually two copies of these egg beaters here, but um, you know, on each of those generators for each of those copies, it's just zero. Okay, so we've got that. And then the question is, okay, well, maybe there's some map coming out of the other generator hitting the tip of this bottom cone here. Well, um, what do we know about the, you know, egg beater cohomology structure? I know that if I take uh, Z times alpha, that's the sign same as taking y times beta. And that's just a linearity argument is gonna tell us that we can't have anything non-zero coming out of alpha either. Because if this map here is non-zero, then it's, you know, we got some non-zero map coming from z times alpha. Um, but that's the same as requiring a non-zero map coming out of y times beta. But the differential on beta is zero, so that would be a contradiction. So we actually get that the differential on alpha has to be zero as well. Okay, so the differential coming out of all those generators uh, is zero. So the total differential is zero. This means then that everything here in red is in the kernel, everything in blue is in the co-kernel. So again, we kind of regroup and we say, okay, now we know what the additive structure is and we can ask what the module structure is, you know, is there some non-trivial extension? Uh, the computation or the, the understanding of why this is true is not as nicely justified as in the previous cases. It turns out that there were, I had to kind of prove this algebraically that there were no non-trivial extensions, um, but um, you know, we can just say in this case that there aren't any extensions. And so what you see is what you get. Uh, the cohomology looks like the M3, a shifted M3, and then two copies of this egg beater cohomology. And I can again ask the question, okay, how does this differ from that of the sphere? So what changed whenever I performed this operation in the cohomology? Uh, well, my sphere cohomology, again, is just M3 and a shifted M3. And so then the only kind of different piece that's appearing is this two copies of this egg beater cohomology. And that also is indicative of a larger pattern. So in general, if I have some space and I perform this ribbon surgery on it, what I end up seeing is two copies of the egg beater cohomology showing up every time. So I guess that's pretty much it. And I just want to kind of display the main result. It's not pretty and I don't expect you to read it, but this is just kind of like the answer for all of those three classes of spaces that I had mentioned earlier. And I'll just highlight a few things. So really just emphasizing points that I've already mentioned, but what you see if you kind of like, uh, pay attention to, you know, how much of each of these modules are showing up, you know, we get, if I start with some space, I perform some number of ribbon surgeries, then you can see, okay, in this case, I perform K ribbon surgeries, and that's kind of dictating how many of these egg beater cohomologies are showing up. And then if I perform some equivariant connect sum surgery with some, you know, genus G surface, or I guess this would be genus in the G hold Torah sense, uh, then I see some number of copies of these shifted uh, C3 towers showing up. And, and again, that's determined by the genus of whatever it was that I connect them on. And this, this pattern kind of continues, you know, here, there, the, um, we, we start with some space and then we perform some number of ribbon surgeries. And again, this number is telling you something about how many of these egg beaters are showing up. Yeah, there was additionally some egg beaters showing up coming from the, the cohomology of these hex towers, but still the, the pattern kind of continues. You perform the ribbon surgery, you get some egg beater cohomologies. You perform a connect sum, you get some of these towers. And the same thing's happening in the non-orientable case for the most part. So yeah, I think that's a good place to top, a stop and apparently perfect timing somehow. Uh, thank you guys for listening. <laughs> yep, thank you, Kelly. Let's all take a moment to thank Kelly. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, I, I have two questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi guys. So, uh, the first question is when you when you speak the quotient lemma. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you you take the space 
and quotient down the action. Mm -hmm. uh, do you do you mean that, or you you gonna take uh, the Borel space, the, the homotopy quotient? Uh, no, I just mean the quotient. I believe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and and I have another question. Yeah. Kind of for Sarah. Uh, so if this video will be uploaded or together yes. with the the one yes, on both, Monday. Both videos from this week will be okay. uploaded, and I'll send them out in an email next week. Okay. Thank you. If there are no other questions, well, I have some questions, or at least a question. Um, Kelly, I was wondering how far you've gotten with that, like extending this work or these sorts of computations either to other groups or like cyclic prime groups or something like Klein 4 possibly, if that's something that interests you or be like this is great <laughs> this is enough of this type of computation no I think so I kind of started thinking and there was a very optimistic part of me that whenever I originally filled out this form felt like oh yeah we'll talk about all odd primes and that just doesn't happen which is why I asked you to change the title um I think I have high suspicions that uh the result for general odd prime is going to look extremely reminiscent of this result. And I think I just, before can before I can say that definitively, really need to spend some time meditating a little bit more on like, you know, kind of the basics of this ROCP graded cohomology, just because this, you know, it's not just bi-graded anymore, it's, it's a lot more complicated. So I'm just still trying to like deeply understand that a little bit better, but, um, you know, I know there's a way to just consider that, you know, it's sufficient to think about those, at least in the cyclic prime case, as bi-graded in some sense, because there's a lot of symmetry going on. Um, and I'm currently working on that, and I'm so far kind of discovering that there's, it's just very analogous in some sense. Like, I mentioned before that I have this result about the surfaces in the odd prime case being built out of all the same components and you have effectively the same result but you know asterisk like there's some additional caveats I have to add on to that with like oh, okay but maybe you have to twist some of the pieces a little bit first um but I think that all kind of contributes back to this like extra symmetry you can kind of easily get to some of the results from boiling it down to something a little bit more simple. Um, the the Maybe I just said a whole lot of nothing there. What I'm trying to say is that I'm decently close to saying something in the general odd prime, cyclic odd prime case, um, but it's nothing definitive yet. Like I have very big suspicions about what's going on and I'm decently close to actually saying something concrete, but I'm not quite there at the moment. Okay, great, very cool. <laughs> um, any other questions? All right, well, let's thank Kelly again 